All right. So um, today uh, uh, we're gonna talk about masters of engraving. And uh, I've got really uh, interesting things to show you. Um, I'm sure that uh, this information will be new to you, especially because very few people really know now uh, what's the tradition of, uh, of engraving on plates, uh, on copper plates, on wood, uh, what role Durer played in, in all of that. Uh, of course, I'm also going to show you some works of Rembrandt and uh, Goya. Um, those were uh, real masters and uh, their work is, is truly impressive. Hello. Hi. Okay, so let's begin. Now, clearly what you see here on the screen is, uh, is a very crude work. It's a, it's a crude work, woodcut. Uh, it, uh, this sort of work started to appear in Europe by 1400s. Now, uh, you can see that, uh, uh, that the artist is, was really struggling with the material. And usually the problem uh, was that, was that um, uh, the wood would break under, under pressure. And the thin lines were uh, felt as if um, it would be just uh, not possible to, to do any detailed work on wood because the wood would crack and the lines would break under pressure. Now, they, they resembled uh, this, uh, coloring books in their design and they, they meant to, to be colored by hand or by stencils. So uh, same way as if uh, children books are, are made today when there's just a black outline printed and then the kids are filling the, uh, the color in. Here you see it's not very precise and the artist used a, a watercolor to paint over the image. And the image itself, you can see that it's not really uh, that, that at all impressive. Now, because the book printing started to develop at a very rapid speed, there was a, a big demand for illustrations. Of course, a book is a lot more interesting to engage with if there are drawings in it and illustrations in it. So with time, the, the subject matter of the books became more sophisticated and so did the, the illustration that appeared in them. Now the guy who made uh, a huge, who had a huge influence on the technique uh, of the woodcut printing was, yes, Albrecht Dürer, born in Nuremberg, Germany, which was at that time one of the biggest uh, artistic and commercial cent centers in Europe. So 15th and 16th century in Nuremberg was a, was a real uh, a center for the arts. Now he began uh, as an apprentice in his, in his father's silver uh, goldsmith workshop. His father was a jeweler and goldsmith and the Durer learned from him. But then he went, he went on to study from a another Nuremberg painting and started to attempt to do some woodcuts. Uh, he worked for some time in Basel and his work started to appear there. Now he was a Durer. And can anybody tell me anything about Durer? I hope among 23 people that are here, at least one of you has heard his name before and know who he was. It would be very uh, disappointing if you didn't, if you never heard the name of Albrecht Dürer. It's, that would just uh, signify how far you are from arts in general, because this is, I mean, his name is, is, uh, uh, is put next to names of Da Vinci and Michelangelo and Botticelli and uh, all the, the grand artists of the, of the history. So I'm surprised you did, you've never heard his name, but I hope after this class, you will know who he was. So he was a painter, he was a draftsman, and he was a writer. 
but his first uh, and probably greatest artistic impact was in the medium of the printmaking. Now his technique was so flawless that his contemporary Erasmus of Rotterdam, and I hope you heard the name of Erasmus, I mean, somebody has to know, Erasmus of Rotterdam, never heard. Uh, well, Erasmus uh, claimed that to add color to Durer's work would be to injure it. it, it he found it so flawless. Now I transformed the woodcut with fully realized works in black and white um, with a lot of subtle gradations of tone and suggestions of texture. Now guys, I'll pause for one minute and I will ask you uh, to turn on your videos because um, this is, uh, first it's difficult for me. Uh, I, I, I see just, pictures and your names and it's difficult for me to deliver the material to you because I have some feeling as if you are just not listening and uh, it's just running somewhere there on the background so uh, uh, I haven't been so insistent on, on on that so far but you have to understand as an instructor this is very difficult for me uh, when you are just uh, putting a picture or, or just your name there. So um, thanks Mariam and Bella too uh, for... for uh... I'm sorry, I'm trying to turn on my video, but there's a problem with my computer's camera and Zoom cannot detect it for some reason. Okay. All right, well, at least you tried, Sona. Thanks. Um, so Durer, uh, Durer made a big impact. He was he was the first one who managed to pull off a, a very high, very skilled, a very detailed work. Now, Durer believed that the Germans were inferior to their neighbors to the south, to the Italians, uh, because they lacked the theoretical knowledge uh, about art, such as, for example, perspective and things like that. So he he that uh, he, because he felt that Germany was lagging behind, he published his first uh, treatise on, uh, on art of measurement. So he wanted to compensate for, uh, for the lack of knowledge in Germany. Now, and then he wrote four books of human proportion. It was very important for the arts, you know, to, 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 to be able to understand what beautiful proportion is and here you on, on this screen you see his his uh, attempts to measure a proportion of a human face of course some of these figures look almost grotesque but that he was just uh, doing to emphasize how significant the change can be in a human uh, human face and also in the human body now durer was very much in love with italy so he visited Italy twice, um, and he saw the great works of the Italian Renaissance and uh, all the classical heritage and uh, theoretical writings of Italy really inspired him. He, he, he developed a serious interest in human form and it shows in his uh, nude and antique studies, uh, studies uh, so these Italian experiences of Dura were very impactful on him. Uh, and uh, also the Venetian color and design is, uh, it can be the influence of, of his trip to Italy can be seen in this painting. Um, it was commissioned to Dura by the German colony of merchants that lived in Venice. So uh, here you can see that this Italian treatment of, uh, of color and light resonated. You have to understand there was a big difference between Germany and Italy. Yeah, Germans were very uh, conservative. Also, there were uh, Lutherans, there were Protestants, and uh, Italy was, was a Catholic, a Catholic country. And Protestantism never really uh, put a root in, in, in Italy. So, there was a big difference in perception, uh, both on, on German and Italian, and Dürer tried to bridge that 
No, he, he, because he was so talented that, uh, and he was such an intellectual that he attracted uh, most prominent figures of his time in German society. He was uh, the official court artist of the Holy Roman Emperor, actually two emperors, Charles V and Maximilian I. So Dürer designed a lot of work for them uh, and did different artistic projects. Now, Erasmus uh, and Nuremberg, as I mentioned, was a, a, a very vibrant center of humanism and uh, it was the first uh, to officially embrace the Reformation, like I said. Catholicism was under fire in Germany and Luther, Martin Luther, uh, did a lot of reformation work to the church. So uh, Dürer also drew his, uh, his friends and this is a portrait of Erasmus of Rotterdam, one of the biggest humanists of German school. Now, in a woodcut of Dürer, um, he expanded the tonal and dramatic range. It really, it was a big step forward by the age of 30. He had completed three of his most famous series on religious subjects. The first one was the Apocalypse. And then there was large woodcut, uh, woodcut passion cycle. And the last one was the life of the Virgin. Now, if we talk about difficult time. In Europe, the Black Death killed in mid 1300s, killed almost half of Europe's population. Uh, and the survivors of that uh, plague and the descendants, four generations dreaded the last things predicted in apocalypse. They really thought that the end of the world has come because the disease sp spread like fire, uh, killed almost uh, half of Europe. Now, this subject of apocalypse uh, started to appear in many woodcuts. And, Ger and Durer must have seen them when he was a child. So it, uh, because they were printed in Germany and appeared in Cologne for the first time. So this, uh, these first crude drawings of the apocalypse, um, uh, they were uh, for him, it, they were like seeds put in, a, in his brain that after the time started to take root and he, uh, he started to think more and more about this subject of the apocalypse, which became one of his most impressive work. Now, it's a, it's a cycle of, of about 50 pictures about the end of the world, which included the four terrible horsemen release, uh, re released by breaking seals of pestilence, war, famine, and death. So this famous uh, gravure uh, woodcut of Dürer, and here you can see these four horsemen of apocalypse. These are the, the horsemen that uh, unleashed death upon death and destruction upon human, uh, humankind. Um, it has unprecedented emotional power and graphic expressiveness. Now, volume and depth, light and shadow, texture and surface are all created with black ink on, on white paper. So it becomes a metaphor for light in a turbulent war, a world of, of awesome powers. Now, apocalypse charged the symbol with experience. These four horsemen exhaust the theme in the way that Raphael exhausted the theme of Madonna and the ga exhausted the theme of ballet dancer. So nobody could after Dürer uh, paint, uh, and compose such work. This was his peak. He was only 27. He went on to produce a small but self-contained group of images. They, they, they were called master engravings. And his search for the ideal nude led him to engrave Adam and Eve. Um, this is 1504. And uh, this is how Dürer, you can really see uh, how, how different the Germans were, were perceiving the, the, the human body. I mean, the Italians 
were very different and uh, and of course here you already see some uh, some impact of uh, of Italian experiences of Durer. Now he he thought it's his masterpiece, so it's this is the only uh, print of Durer that he signed with his full name and his address. So. Uh, the, the technique is impeccable. He he modeled the flesh with this powdering of dots and flicks of delicacy that's never seen, never been seen before. Um, but the engraving in general fails to satisfy because it feels like he was uh, striving too tensely to achieve his masterpiece. So details still the show in this work. Now. Um, this was a gothic dream of the Christian knight braving the valley of the shadow and in, and in his companion, his companions are the death and the devil. These are the, this is how the, uh, this engraving is called, knight, death and the devil, 1513. Now the horse is interesting. The horse is modeled uh, on a stallion which he saw uh, in San Marco in Venice, on the top of San Marco, there are four horses, beautiful horses. Actually, they were attributed to the fourth century Greek sculptor, Lysippus. Venice is, is, uh, is famous in San Marco. Um, have, has anybody, anyone been in Venice? Anyone ever vin visited? Yes. Bella, you've been in Venice, yeah? Yes, I have. Okay, so you've seen San Marco. Uh, uh, yeah, we went to a museum that uh, had a collection. Oh. Um, although we weren't allowed to get very close because I don't know why during the summer the lines were very long, but yes, it was, it was yeah. very, very beautiful. I was, I was in Venice uh, um, because I had a, a lecture there um, about the Armenian calligraphy and uh, I was for two days in Venice and I was lucky it was winter so there were very few uh, were well, relatively fewer uh, tourists so San Marco is just it blew my mind I mean I, I've, I've seen beautiful cities in my life and I lived in Amsterdam but when, when I went to Venice it really shook me because I've never imagined a city so beautiful um, it's a city of arts and everywhere you go, everywhere you look, it's just, uh, it's just beautiful architecture. And, uh, but San Marco is very special because it has these Byzantine frescoes, mosaics inside. It's just, I've never seen anything like that in my life ever, anywhere. So I can imagine that, uh, um, that Dura was just as, as, as impressed when he went to Venice and, and he saw the horses on top of San Marco. So this stallion in this engraving uh, is modeled upon one of those horses. Now, he, it's, uh, if, if we count his work, this is his 70th work on, on, on copper. Now, copper made a big difference, right? Because copper is metal. And uh, when you do work on metal, you've got more freedom to produce more subtle textures. And, uh, uh, and of course, he had an experience because his fa father was goldsmith. So he worked with metal early on. Um, this, uh, he, the work that uh, the gravers of Durer were so good that all the subsequent serious painters uh, never really attempted the same as Durer did and actually decided at some point that they should leave the, uh, the work to professionals that were actually copying and reproducing uh, artists work. They never attempted to engrave themselves because Durer was just, uh, I think he said <laughs> the, the plank so high that uh, after him nobody ever really tried. Now there are these three uh, master engravings that I talked about. Uh, this one is called Saint Jerome in his study. Um, uh, Saint Jerome was the translator of the Bible into Latin. And uh, his, uh, his, this work is also loaded with symbolism. And because we're gonna talk about 
symbolism and your assignment is going to be uh, to analyze one of the uh, etchings of Durer. Uh, I'm not going to go uh, into detail. Or maybe you'll pick this work to, to talk about uh, because it's loaded with symbolism. So I'm just going to talk about this work. And this is the melancholy. And it's melancholy, one of the three master engravings. It's this one. That is titled Melancholy. And it's, it's a masterpiece in a point of a technique alone. These are the three works that I mentioned, Saint Jerome, Adam and Eve, and Melancholia. Um, there are no way a series, three of them, each one is a standalone work, but they, they correspond to, uh, to, to three kinds of virtue in medieval philosophy, moral, theological, and intellectual. And this already shows how uh, how complex was Durer's thought at that time when he was producing work loaded with, with, with symbolism. So no artist, no painter uh, was better fitted to, uh, by training to bring the process of woodcut in printing to maturity the way that this is a woodcut actually. Um, so it's loaded with symbolic and mythological meaning and let us understand what's going on. So there is this creature flying in a background. Uh, it looks like a bat. Uh, she holds uh, the title of the work on which it's engraved, Melancholia One. Now, um, there's this dark figure, uh, a female. She looks like female, she looks like a woman, even though this is an angel and because she's got wings and uh, angels do not have sex, right? They're neither male or female. And beside her, we see this little figure um, that was in the middle ages was called genius. It, this was the accompanying spirit. That's how it was called, everybody uh, people believe that everyone has a, a genius, his own genius, his, his spirit that accompanies him. Now, she's got, uh, uh, she's got wings and from her belt, you can see here, there are keys hanging from her belt and there is a money bag here. So these two keys and the money bag symbolize power and wealth. At her feet, we see tools. So tools that are used to fashion the material world. See, there is, uh, these are the tools of, uh, of a carpenter. There's an animal also here. It looks like a dog to me. Now she's lost in thought. Uh, she does nothing, she's paralyzed. She's just sitting there staring uh, into nowhere. She turns away from the light. She holds a caliper in her hand, a compass, and she's surrounded by uh, other tools associated with ge geometry, one of the seven liberal arts that underlies artistic creation. Um, because uh, it's there because Durer believed that um, through geometry he could approach perfection in his own work. Um, now, the question, the common question is why one? Why melancholia one? What is this one symbolize? This is number. Yeah, so um, and this is the explanation. The creativity in the arts was the, the realm of imagination which was considered the first and the lowest in hierarchy of three categories of genius. So genius had three different categories and creativity in art was the lowest and number one. The other, the second was the realm of reason and the third was the realm of spirit. So that's, maybe it shows an intent of Durer actually continuing this and producing two and three, but that has never happened. So Melancholia uh, was left with, with, with one. And that's, that's where the, 
um, the number symbolizes now. It shows an image of, a, of, of an artist who's paralyzed and powerless. It's really what this figure communicates. Um, it's a pick of Durer's work. Now he was about, uh, Durer was about 20 years younger than Leonardo. And uh, he, he became uh, greatly interested in the relationship between mathematics and art. Now, uh, Leonardo, and there was another mathematician, Luca Pacioli, uh, Leonardo illustrated his work. Um, certainly both of them influenced Durer in his studies. Now, you can see there is this square here on top of her engraved on the wall. And this is interesting because this is a magic square, magic, magic square, this is how it's called. There are numbers there. There are 86 different combinations of four numbers and all sum up to 34. So rows, columns, and corners, if you sum them up, all of, all of the uh, will come to number 34. Interestingly, at the bottom row, the, the middle two numbers is the year of the engraving, 1514. This is the year that he engraved this work. And, um, and also the numbers in the corners of the same row, four and one, uh, are interchangeable with the let letters A and D, first and the fourth, uh, which are the monogram of Dürer, Albrecht Dürer. So he almost used that, those numbers religiously um, as a monogram. Now, the sum of all the numbers in the Dürer's magical square is 136. Now, the, the number that conceals both the masters and the title of the master work, there is another mathematical joke in, in, in this, because if you sum up uh, all the numbers, it, will, it spells the name of Jesus Christ in Greek, and the number is 2,368. So it shows, it's interesting because it shows that an artist is not just an artist, is also very much interested in mathematics, in numbers, in relationships of numbers to each other. And uh, this is, uh, it, it always puzzled people, this magic square in, in the famous Melancholia. Now, who can tell me what, 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 what do you think this, this work symbolizes? Why did Dürer create this? Why did he touch upon the subject of melancholia? I'm sure everyone uh, here has experienced melancholia in your life. Yes, Yeva? That's exactly what I was gonna say. Maybe it's something that we all kind of share. It's uh like something that each human being went through or will go through at least once in their life. So maybe that's also one of the reasons why he wanted to like portray that. Okay, but uh, when you feel melancholic, can you describe the feeling to me? How does it feel like to be to feel melancholy? What, what, how, do you, how do you feel? Um, the expression of the face of the angel, it's so melancholic. <laughs> I think he did a great job uh, expressing it because you don't know what you feel. It's not like you're alone or you're also mad. You don't know what you're mad at, but um, you're just lost and you're trying to do something to get out of it, but it isn't really working. That's probably why she's holding something as if she's being productive or trying to do something, but it's not actually moving anywhere. Okay. So Interesting. the whole emotions are quite expressed through her face, which is just amazing. Yeah. Okay. Let's hear what Sona has to say. I guess there is also the chaotic setting that uh, represents melancholia because I guess it's like, uh, you know, it's like, uh, it's like a messy room, just a feeling of melancholia and, uh, because you 
you feel like you know what you need to do in order to make it neat. Like you need to just tidy up the room, but you don't even have the energy to tidy up the room because you don't feel like it. And it's just... So would you say, would you say that melancholy is sort of apathy when you're apathetical and you don't seem to care about anything and you just want to, you feel blue? maybe i guess yeah i guess it's both uh not caring about anything but also caring about some specific things okay interesting arame yes um i think Dura tried to show kind of an existential crisis because all the attributes are for the science and science basically seeks to find answers mm -hmm. and in this case i can assume that the lady, I mean, the angel cannot find the answers through the yeah. science. And it's kind of a reference to that some, some things are metaphysical and you can find the answers of everything through science. Great, great, thank you. We need, uh, we need to understand that what Durer draws here, paints here, uh, through, uh, through this work is a spiritual self-portrait. Is um, he understands that there is a link between melancholy and creative genius, because the gift of creativity comes with terrible risks. The terrible risks that if you go too deep in it, if it becomes too spiritual for it, it can cause um, melancholy. It can cause this apathy. And uh, this is the danger of too much spiritual work. And this is what Durer actually paints, uh, paints, draws here. He draws himself, he draws himself in, a, in this uh, state of apathy. And Arame pointed out that all these tools that are surrounding her is actually um, helpless to help her because she's, uh, she's clearly stuck in this, uh, in this, in this feeling of uh, impotence and not ability to do anything. Now, here you see a self-portrait of Durer as Christ. He painted himself as Christ here. Um, but here you see a, a successful, self-reassuring master, you know, eager to assert his creative genius and inherent nobility very clear diet or forebodding outlook he has here uh, so that's a, that's a famous self-portrait of Dürer. now this is his uh, a statue yes yeah is, isn't it weird that he tried to portray him like jesus or is it a regular thing because you have to have lots of uh, self i don't know love to do that i mean it's not a typical thing to do Cha? yeah of course of course it, it is not it's a speculation he did not title this work in in in, in that way it's a self-portrait but because of the way that he painted himself because of the his hair his beard it's like mm -hmm. if i didn't tell you that this is durer you could have easily said that this is a portrait of christ and this is, how, this is why uh, this meaning is alluded uh, to this work. But he did have the intention of doing that, right? He, he most likely did, because just look at, at the way he looks at you, right? Look at the expression in his eyes. Look uh, how superbly executed this work is. This just, uh, this shows um, a lot of spirit in it. Mm -hmm. and spirit and intellect um, all those attributes uh, of Christ and um, so it's it's not surprising that this work and it is not the only one by the way of the painters who did that uh, mm -hmm. yeah you could uh, it was maybe it was enough for you to have this uh, you know long flowing hair and the, and the beard and you you look like Christ and uh, and well maybe it was also the fashion at that time you know 
the way that they cut their hair, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, in either case, uh, this, is, this portrait is, uh, is, is a masterpiece of his, uh, his painting, um, no doubt. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> it's interesting that the epitaph on his grave in Nuremberg, and this is a statue of Dürer in Nuremberg says on it, whatever was more mortal in Albrecht Dürer lies beneath this mound. Whatever mortal of him lies here. Well, all the immortal part of him is clearly elsewhere. Now, another painter I, I want to talk, and this is, we move a little bit further in time, or closer to us in time, this is Anthony Van Dyck, who lived for about, uh, about 50 years uh, after Turer, and he was British. Now, uh, he, was, uh, he was known uh, as, a, as a student of Rubens, Peter Paul Rubens, who was the Prince of Arts at that time. He was his, his the most brilliant student and uh, independent collaborator because Rubens recognized such talent in, in Van Dyck that he, he clearly, he very, very quickly offered him to collaborate. Uh, so he went in his early, like most painters, doesn't matter, from all over Europe, for them going to Italy was like going on a pilgrimage. And uh, maybe even today you could say the same. If you go to Italy, you go for, to see, the art, you go to Italy to see, uh, to be inspired. And uh, he went, and Van Dyck went to Italy uh, when he was in his 20s. Um, so in Italy, he saw probably portraits of the eminent man, important man, and it inspired him to produce a cycle of, 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 of works, of, of engravings. Um, so he hired Rubens' uh, crew of engravers to publish his own portraits of artists and writers uh, in prints of uniform format. So he took the same size, same proportion, same plate, and he wanted to produce a cycle of, uh, of these important people. Most of them were his friends. So here, for example, you see the, uh, the few stages of the development of the print. If you notice, you see the arm here and the details are not, there, there are no details here. So it's just, this is the first bite of etching that was produced. Basically, do you know how uh, etching works? Now, what you do, you take a metal plate, a copper plate, you cover the copper, copper plate with the thin layer of varnish. Then you take a needle and you scratch that varnish by drawing the work, and then you put that plate into acid. Now, wherever the varnish was scratched, the acid penetrates and eats out the metal plate. Then you remove the, the varnish and you have your drawing etched into metal. Now, what it does, and that's quite impressive because when you look at the line, the line becomes so rich with texture because the acid never bites, never, never bites the metal equally. So the, every line becomes very enriched in different texture. And, uh, and then you can continue working on it actually. <laughs> you, you run the first print and then you take, you can rework this again and again and add more detail and add more detail at the later stage. So here you see in this etching of Van Dyck that he's actually uh, was in the middle. Now, this, the, this cycle of works of Van Dyck became, no, became to be known as iconography. These are the portraits of, um, of the famous man lived at, at that time. Now Van Dyck lived for success and not struggle. He, he died young. He died in, when he was only 42. His iconography was then, has reached 80 plates to which his successors added 44. <laughs> and interesting, Louvre in 1851, Louvre bought all the coppers of Van Dyck from which it still sells passable impressions 
pulled from the electro -tenor. So Louvre goes and buys the plates of Van Dyck, still produces prints from them and sells them. That's 1851. That's interesting. So Van Dyck is a, is a, is a great master of, of engraving and etching. You see, so it's, it's, it looks like uh, so fluid. So uh, at the same time, complex and interesting, very live, uh, lively work. Van Dyck was a great master of, of, of etching. And let's talk about Rembrandt. Van Rijn, another great uh, master of, of engraving. Now, Re Rembrandt is, is, is just a unique personality in art. He's always, when his name is mentioned, it feels like you're talking about a, just a separate phenomena. Um, he's, uh, he's, he has his own style that you can never mistake with anybody else. And uh, his influence on art was immense. Now, this, this etching that you see here, that's Christ appearing to people. You can still see here, you see the stages of the work. This is the second state uh, of two. They actually only printed two, and this is the second state of this etching. Um, interesting, this work is, uh, is reclining, a reclining female nude. It's actually a black uh, girl. Uh, and interesting how he handled uh, the texture, the color of the body, which is black, and uh, see how many strokes uh, this this pattern this that he created to achieve uh, the, the impression of the black body. Uh, it's, it's very understated work of Rembrandt. is not really well known. Uh, and this uh, is Three Crosses. It's one of the most finest works of Rembrandt in any medium. It shows, uh, it represents the, co uh, the culmination of his virtuosity as a printmaker. Now he drew on copper plate entirely in dry point. That is, he didn't do etching. He actually didn't apply varnish on top of the metal plate. He drew on metal plate directly. Now, when you do that, it's called dry point, not etching. Etching is always using the varnish and then scratching the varnish. When dry point means you draw directly with the needle on a plate. Um, so this is dry point. It's a lot harder, by the way. I, I tried both and it's a lot harder because you have to scratch the metal directly when in case of etching, you only scratch the varnish. So it's, it's, it's physically a lot more demanding to do dry point than, than etching. Now, he printed this on vellum and the vellum itself is not, it doesn't, didn't have, uh, it wasn't white. So he fully like exploits the, the color of vellum, which is like a light is shining from this work. If you look at it, uh, uh, it, it, it's softening the lines and uh, it enhances the richness of the of the entire effect. This uh, work of Rembrandt. So it doesn't matter what you give it, give to him any subject, Bible, landscape, portraits, whatever Rembrandt does, he handles this with with virtuosity. Um, that is rarely seen. Now the last uh, artist I'm gonna talk about is Goya. And Francisco de Goya, Spanish, 18th century. And uh, interesting what was happening in 18th century. Yeah, the old way of art collapsed uh, together with the old way of, of life. And uh, uh, this was a turbulent time in, in, in human history, especially in the history of Spain. Now, uh, Goya also went through a, a personal crisis, an emotional crisis, uh, because he was ill that he almost went deaf from that illness. And Goya um, published the first long sets of prints that ever made in Spain that came to be known as Caprichos. 
80 plates that he, he printed. Uh, and they comment on the ignorance of Spanish medievalism. Uh, they confront us with the, whatever it is that visits you and me in a sleep. This, for example, is a famous work. It's called The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. This is Goya. Now, uh, he recovered, luckily, and um, uh, recovered to work uh, again. Uh, and he started to also employ the technique of aqua tint, which was to combi combine etching with, uh, with another uh, style of, of printing to get, for example, through aqua tint, you can get entire big parts of the image tinted with the tone without having to achieve that through, you know, through hatch lines, you could tint in pieces of the plate in tone, just put one tone down and uh, this is the aqua tint and a dry point and itching. Three techniques combined, combined in one print. Um, now, Napoleon invaded Spain and took Madrid and uh, Madrid rebelled against Napoleon uh, armies in 1808 and uh, Goya saw these disasters of war. Um, 20,000 people starved to death all around him in Madrid and Goya produced a line of etchings called the disasters of war. Um, the shortage of the materials that he had <laughs> force him to take his plates and cut them in two because he didn't have plates to work on anymore. So he would use the same plates, produce prints, then basically destroy them to make new work because he did not have enough tools to work with. So he, he faced the war with the individualistic passion of the Spanish Christian. And you can see that from his works now. After this anguish ended in 1814, Goya uh, produced a fanciful historical sequence of bullfights in 33 aqua tints. Uh, bullfights were, were and still are popular in Spain and Goya observed them. Uh, he went and he sketched and, uh, uh, and Goya here, look, he, he drew a man in the air that was, that was very difficult to do, right? Uh, so he, uh, Goya made good on his claim that a painter should observe a man falling from the roof exactly enough to go home and draw him. So see a man fall from a roof? Remember the fall so well that you can go back, go home and actually draw that. Uh, and this is the last work I'm going to show you. Um, it's called The Colossus. This is the, um, it shows, uh, it almost feels like it's classical antique bronze, uh, sometime like coming from the, uh, from the ancient world. Um, he probably, um, because Goya went to Rome as well, he probably has seen some uh, bronze boxers, the famous statue of a bronze boxer and it resembles a little bit in the position of the body uh, and in, in this etching that uh, is aqua tint that Goya produced. Um, so this is, this is all I have for you today. So Dürer, uh, Van Dyck, Goya, there are a few, quite a few other uh, talented printmakers and artists that produced prints, but unfortunately we don't have time to talk about all of them. But uh, since you have not heard the name of Durer before, I hope this class rectifies that for you. I will grade your work uh, today and tomorrow. So I expect to receive your grades. If you have any more, any questions, you go ahead and ask me. And if you don't, you're free to go. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, it's uh, concerning my my uh, absence.
uh, I couldn't join because of the horrible connection. Uh, if the class is recorded, could you please send me the recording to my email? Okay, okay, I will upload it to, uh, to YouTube and give you the link. Okay, thank you so much. Sure.